My name is Mike Seeley. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this Odyssey program. And uh, Steve, I know, is flattered at the turnout tonight, but we usually get twice as many people in this. You know? uh, couple of housekeeping details. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Odyssey Committee, I want to thank so many of you who have so generously contributed to our treasury, which of course is essential to producing good programs for you. I would remind you that on January 27th, we're going to have our every two-year investment panel. Uh, I consider this essential to preserving your net worth and enlarging it. And we have a terrific lineup. This year, uh, somewhat differently, we have two experts in income investing. Richard Lehman, who puts out a newsletter for Forbes, and Martin Friedson, who many of you know, is a pretty seriously good uh, high-yield investor. I also, that's enough of the housekeeping. Uh, anybody brought their calendars, I want you to write in July, look up, where would they look for that? Steve is going to be conducting a debate with Paul Krugman <coughs> in Las Vegas before 2,000 people. Uh, I haven't checked the odds, and of course it's Vegas, so somebody's going to be making an uh, odds in the outcome. So you want to catch that one. Let me now uh, turn to uh, how Stephen Moore came between me and my wife. Uh, we live in Vermont in the off-season, and in Vermont, until recently, you could have your newspapers delivered. And um, early in our married life, my wife would roll over in bed in the morning, and she'd find me reading the Wall Street Journal. She found that unromantic. But I persisted in this aberrant behavior. So finally she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. She said, why are you doing that? Because I said, I like to start the day on a high note. <laughs> <laughs> a few years went by and uh, my good friend John McClowry, who started a modest think tank in Vermont, obviously with very little effect. Uh, <laughs> we are the home of Bernie Sanders. Uh, and he invited Steve to come up and talk to the annual Republican convention. And, and in those days, I was briefly and pitifully and effectually the finance chairman of the party. And Steve was the speaker. So finally, I got to see this guy, as you will tonight, who had been writing all these fabulous editorials in the Wall Street Journal. And the thing that stands out from that wonderful presentation, Steve, was he pointed out that the Wall Street Journal, and I hope I'm not stealing one of your laugh lines. I am. He just confirmed it. The Wall Street Journal is the only, edit, only uh, newspaper in the world where they print the news on the editorial page and the speculation on the news page. <laughs> and of course, uh, we've all gotten to know Steve and his work in recent years that he appears with increasing frequency on television. Uh, frequently in a face-off arranged by Larry Kudlow and others with my Dartmouth classmate and friend Bob Reich, the former labor secretary. And I'd only want to point out that when I knew Bob at Dartmouth, he was six foot eight. <laughs> uh, and it shows you who won those debates. Uh, Enough, enough about introduction. There's a wonderful uh, leaflet I think Dennis prepared uh, that describes in detail Steve's extremely distinguished background. Uh, he couldn't be here at a better time uh, to talk to us about the future of our country, uh, which some of us consider to be in peril. We all, for example, hear that the government deficit is X. Uh, to, which, to which I say, uh, pardon me ladies, bullshit. Uh, people like uh, Lawrence Kotlikoff at MIT look at it the way most of you guys and women who have been in the business world would look at it. You add up 
the numbers, and then you do a discount on present value of all the obligations and promises we've made. Then you get a number that's roughly, according to Kotlikoff and his colleagues, well in excess of $200 trillion. I mean, that is, to me, a mind-boggling number. And if you do the math, as wonderful liberals like Bill McGibbon, the environmentalists, tell you to do, you come up with a number that's almost $700,000 for every man, woman, and child in our country. So we got a problem. And fortunately, we got the right guy here tonight to tell us what to do about it. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Stephen Moore. Um, good evening, folks. What a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for uh, coming out. I had such a nice reception this morning. I flew into the Palm Beach Airport, and I was kind of I was walking through the terminal with my bags, and this lovely woman, she just ran up to me, and she was so excited. She threw her arms around me, and she said, she was, I mean, it was just so endearing. She said, I know you, don't I? <laughs> I said, I, I said, she said, I'm sure I've seen you on TV. And I said, and I just couldn't help kind of teasing her a little bit. So, you know, and she's looking up at me and I said, uh, well, um, I said, I don't know, ma'am. I said, what do you watch? <laughs> and she, she was so cute. And she looked at, she, she couldn't quite fit. That kind of puzzled her a little bit. She kept looking at me. She said, oh, yes. She said, wait a minute. She said, didn't I see you on Wheel of Fortune last week? <laughs> yes, ma'am, that was me. Uh, by the way, how many of you watch Fox News here? A lot of you do. Um, how many of you watch uh, MSNBC? You're probably in the wrong room. I'm just, just teasing. Um, thank you for showing up. By the way, you know Fox News. You know their motto, right, at Fox News, fair, balanced, and blonde. <laughs> I've met a lot of beautiful women at Fox News, and uh, it's been fun to, uh, to work with the great people there. Um, and as Mike mentioned, I spent 10 years at the Wall Street Journal, um, which is really the world's greatest uh, newspaper. And how many of you read the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal? Keep reading it. I always tell people, if you want to be the smartest person in the room, read the Wall Street Journal editorials every morning, and, and you will, will be. Um, and, uh, you know, I spent 10, and most of you know, now I'm the chief economist at the Heritage Foundation. How, how many Heritage members here? I think there are a lot of them. Thank you for supporting the great work that we do for the conservative movement. But um, I was talking to, to one of the gentlemen a little bit earlier, and he was asking me about the Wall Street Journal. And he said, you know, of all the 10 years that you worked for the editorial page and for the Wall Street Journal, you know, who was, you must have interviewed a lot of really interesting pe people. Who was the most interesting a person you ever met. And uh, we have, for those of you who read the paper regularly, you know on, on Saturdays we have a, uh, what we call our weekend interview, where we do a long interview with a famous person. And I've, I've ever interviewed everybody from, you know, uh, Bill Clinton to, you know, John McCain to, you know, to the head of uh, Fred Smith, the head of Federal Express, and Charles Schwab, and incredible people. But the most interesting person I met in my 10-year uh, career at the Wall Street Journal was a guy by the name of Art Linkletter. Uh, who, do you, who, raise your hand if you remember Art, who Art Linkletter was. When I talk to young people, you know, they, they, the college students, they're like, who the hell is Art Linkletter? But, you know, for those, you probably all know that Art Linkletter was, you know, the, an incredible guy, by the way. When I m uh, met him and interviewed him, he was 93 years old. He lived up in, uh, in Beverly Hills in the Avenue of the Stars and lived next to Liz Taylor and, you know, had an incredible life. And I just, it was amazing talking to this guy. He was, he knew everybody in the golden age of Hollywood, everybody from Jack Benny to Walt Disney, to Sophia Loren, and on and on and on down the line. He had incredible stories and was just such a joyful and joyous man. And uh, he was just, uh, you, do you all remember the TV show he used to have called Kids Say the Darndest Things? Remember that? And he'd bring up the little, you know, six and seven and eight year olds uh, on, the, on the set and, and they would say the darndest things. And so I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I said, well, Art, of all the years you did that show, what was your favorite story? And he said, without hesitation, he said, one time I brought up this little seven-year-old kid, and in the, this little boy, and in the middle of this interview, you know, with all these millions of people watching, this little boy starts crying and bawling, and the tears are just streaming down his cheek. And, and Art Linkletter 
turns to the little boy and says, you know, Sam, why are you so sad this morning? And the little boy says, well, Mr. Linkletter, my dog just died. And so Art kind of consolingly put his arm around the little boy and said, you know, son, I just want you to know you shouldn't feel so sad about your dog dying because I want to assure you of something. And you should take this to heart, that right now your dog is up in heaven with God. And the little boy <laughs> turns to Art Linkletter and says, well, Mr. Linkletter, what would God want with a dead dog? <laughs> and I just, I love that story. I mean, that's the quinta, quintessential Art Linkletter story. Um, but uh, I, I got to tell you one other story, and then I, I will uh, kind of get serious and talk a little bit about the economy and politics. And then I'd love to take whatever questions you all might have. I think that might be the most uh, fun for us this evening of all. But, I, you know, the other day, I've been traveling. I, I'm probably on the road, you know, uh, two or three day, days a week. And um, the other day, I was on the road. And... Um, President Obama was in Michigan, and I don't know how many of you saw this. I was on the exercise bike. It was like 10 in the morning, and I was watching CNN, and they had uh, this photo that, you know, they, they had the coverage of, of President Obama at this little school in Michigan. He was talking about his education agenda and so on, and he was saying we need more money for schools, and he was talking to these teachers. And then it was so interesting because at one point he, he turned to these children, and there were probably, you know, it was a classroom of about 60 kids in the room. And he said, well, you know, I'd like to take some uh, questions from the children, you know, and, and I really perked up when he said this, I, you know, I thought, this will be interesting. And, and I said, you know, do any of the kids have any questions? And this little boy in the front of the room raises his hand, and uh, I don't know how many of you saw this, it didn't get a lot of press pickup, but the little boy says, uh, you know, son, uh, you know, what is your name? And the little boy says, you know, well, uh, my name is Oliver. Well, um, Oliver, what is your question this morning? And <laughs> Oliver says, well, Mr. President, I wonder if you have any misgivings in, uh, about what happened in Benghazi. <laughs> and, uh, you know, do, do, you think, do you think maybe you could have acted, you know, a little swifter and maybe saved the lives of our, you know, ambassador and our embassy personnel? And you can see President Obama's kind of straightening his tie. And he says, oh, and I just have one other question, Mr. President, you know, my parents just recently lost their health insurance, and I thought you had said that if you liked the health insurance you have, you'd get to keep it. And what would you say to, were you lying to people like my parents when you said that? Well, you know, President Obama is very rarely speechless, but you could see he wasn't quite sure how he was going to answer this. And just at the moment he was about to open his mouth and respond to this question, these questions from this boy, the recess bell went off. And the kids scramble outside, and sure enough, like, you know, 15 minutes later, they reappear in the room and they reassemble, and President Obama's still there t talking. Said, we realized, oh, yes, I was taking some questions from the children. Are there, are there any questions from the children? Well, this, this little girl in the side of the room, this little adorable little blonde girl raised her hand, and the president says, you know, young lady, what's your name? She says, well, Mr. President, my name is Grace. Well, Grace, what is your question this morning? She says, well, I have two questions for you, Mr. President. Um, First of all, why did the recess bell go off 15 minutes early this morning? Uh, and, and, my, and my second question, Mr. President, is what the hell happened to Oliver? <laughs> so that's, that, that's called executive privilege, right? Um, OK, so I am going to get serious. <laughs> And I wanna, what I want to talk to you a little bit about what is going on with this economy and kind of this intersection between politics and economics. And let me start by saying this, that I'm a big believer that if you want to really understand what's going on with the U.S. economy and, and how we've gotten out of this terrible recession that we suffered in 2008 and 9, that there is one industry that has just propelled the U.S. economy and without this incredible revolution in this industry, we, we really would have had no recovery from recession at all. And I wonder who in this room can tell me what industry I'm talking about. Oil. Oil and gas. We are, you all know this, we are now living through the greatest oil and gas boom in the history of this country. And it is something that no one would have ever predicted six or seven years ago. No one, even people in the industry, never thought that this was going to happen. As recently as, you know, two or three years ago, President Obama was running around the country saying, we have to invest in solar energy and windmills and so on because we're running out of oil and gas. He said that, we're running out of oil and gas. Uh, Mr. President, with all due respect, America isn't running out of oil and gas. We are running right smack into it, right, in a big, big way. And so we've had this massive uh, addition 
uh, of production because of what we call the shale oil and gas revolution due to these incredible technologies. And by the way, the reason I like to tell this story, and I've been covering the story of the energy revolution for the last six or seven years, is this was driven not by government. In fact, if anything, government, as you know, has inhibited the oil and gas industry. This has been, uh, and it, by the way, it also wasn't given to us by the, ma the big you know, energy uh, conglomerates, the huge corporations like Exxon and Mobil and, and, uh, and others. This was driven by entrepreneurs and the ingenuity of people who went out there to places like North Dakota and found this oil and gas and found ways to drill for this stuff through these incredible innovations like uh, one, of them, one of them is called uh, horizontal drilling where they now go two miles deep into the ground and these rigs can now go in any direction like a spider web and it makes the, the oil rigs incredibly more productive and efficient in terms of their ability to get at the oil. And then the other huge invention that everyone in this room has heard about is hydraulic fracturing or <gasps> fracking, right? Fracking is an amazing invention where basically they can now, through emitting uh, water and sand and chemicals into the shale rock. And by the way, that shale rock is incredibly thick. It's dense. It's like an armor plate. They're able to crack through that rock two miles deep into the ground. And once they do, that oil and gas that's been stored there for literally hundreds of thousands of years, they're able to pump it out. And it's, it's an incredible, incredible story. And by the way, let, just I want to kind of quiz you as I go along, but I wonder if anyone in this room can tell me of the 50 states which state in the United States has the lowest unemployment rate today? How many of you knew it was North Dakota? A lot of, I heard a lot of you said, North Dakota, uh, until recently, now they're going to face some tough times with these declines in the oil and gas prices, but until um, the last six months, oil and the, 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 the unemployment rate in North Dakota was, not, was officially 2.9%, but it wasn't really 2.9%. The unemployment rate in North Dakota for the last five years has been negative. It's been negative. That is to say, there have been more worker, I mean, more jobs than there are workers to uh, fill those jobs because of the amazing revolution that's going on there. And I wanted to show you, um, this chart shows you exactly what I'm talking about. That red line is the total employment in the United States of all industries outside of oil and gas. Okay, so you can, now this goes through the end of 2013, so it doesn't include the last year where we've had pretty good job growth, but you can see from 2008, from the time the recession began through 2013, there was virtually a net no job growth. In fact, we had not until, until uh, very recently recovered all the jobs that were lost, and then look at the spectacular growth that we saw in the oil and gas industry, and that's, that's just an amazing thing uh, to see. Now, the cool thing about this revolution, by the way, is that... Um, you know, how many, by the way, how many of you in this room have ever been to North Dakota? <laughs> Raise your hand. I had, I had been to every uh, continental state multiple times. I had never been to North Dakota. And by the way, I went there two years ago in uh, January. And you do not want to go to North Dakota in January. It didn't get above zero degrees the whole time I was there. But it is an amazing thing to behold. I mean, the, the jobs are just flowing in uh, so rapidly. And they're using these technologies. And it's not, it's not just happening in, in North Dakota, in Texas, in Oklahoma. Uh, many, how many of you have heard of the, um, many of you heard of the Bakken Shale, which is the one in North Dakota, and then out in, uh, we have uh, the huge Marcellus Shale, which is in West Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and Ohio, and New York, uh, and that, that has, by some, some estimates, about 150 to 200 years worth of natural gas. 150 to 200 years. So we're not running out of this stuff uh, by any means. One of my favorite parts of the story is because of the environmentalists, you know, they're so opposed to fracking and the, oh no, fracking is a terrible thing. We can't do this. Half of them don't even know what fracking is. But, you know, uh, in North, how many of you are transplanted from New York? in this room. How many New Yorkers? A lot of you. Well, you probably know, I don't want to insult anybody in this room, but you know, you've got some dingbats in Albany who are not the smartest people in the world. And, and so the, the legislators in Albany have decided with, with the support of Andrew Cuomo that they're not going to allow fracking. No fracking. You know, this is terrible technology. We're not going to do it, which is a damn shame because in these areas in upstate New York, they could really use the jobs. And these are 60, 80, 100 thousand dollar jobs we're talking about. But no, we don't want to do it because we're going to be green. We're not going to be involved in this, quote, dirty uh, form of energy production. So this is such a great tribute to the American entrepreneurial spirit. Um, you know what they're doing in Pennsylvania now? 
They're drilling down, they're going horizontally under New York, and they're taking out all their oil and gas. I mean, is this a great country or what? But, but the point I'm making is this has been a spectacular run that we've seen. And the reason the price of gasoline is falling in the pump, at the pump today, everybody says, oh, it's because Saudi Arabia is increasing their production. Well, that's part of the story. But why is Saudi Arabia increasing their, uh, their production? The reason they are is because the number one producer in the world today for oil and gas is the United States of America. And you want to know a great part of this story. If we, had, if we could put in place policies that were adapted to try to encourage this industry to, to move forward and continue to produce oil and gas by building pipelines, by drilling on federal lands, because all of this oil and gas production, almost 95% of it has been, has been on private lands, we could raise, you know, you talked, Mike talked about the massive national debt. What a great way to raise revenues to reduce our debt by you know, charging companies to, to uh, royalties and fees to produce on our, on our on, uh, federal lands and so on. And we haven't been doing that. But if we did, and if we started to move forward with these kinds of policies that are just what I call no-brainers, then it is quite possible. I mean, this is an amazing, and probably this won't even amaze a lot of you because it's almost become a conventional wisdom. But I've been saying it for the last three years. Now most people know it. You probably all know it in this room. Within five years, the United States of America, this great, great, great country of ours, is going to move from being an oil and gas import country to an oil and gas export country. Company, a country. We are going to be not only energy independent in five years, we are going to be the energy dominant country in the world. And that's a beautiful thing to think about, right? Now, um, as, as we're seeing this explosion in oil and gas, look at this. The, the second panel here. This is showing you the increase of production in the oil and gas industry versus renewable energy. Now, I, look, I have nothing against renewable energy. If it can work, I'm for it. I'm for what works. I'm for what's economical. But as most of you in this room know, at the federal level, we spent about 75 to $80 billion subsidizing that red line to try to bring that up, right? We've had all of these subsidies for the oil, you know, for the windmills and for the solar and, you know, you know, we're, you know there's all these subsidies for electric cars and all of this stuff. And there's where we are, almost no growth. And then oil and gas, which hasn't received virtually a penny of subsidies, is, is booming. Now, here's the amazing thing. After all of that money has been spent on the uh, renewable energy sector, I wonder who in this room can tell me, today in the United States, what percentage of our electricity production today comes from wind and solar power? Two, I heard two. I heard somebody over here say, uh, Three, I see somebody else saying two. Um, I think you, sir, said two. I hate to tell you this, you're way behind the times. We're up to 2.6%. <laughs> so 2.6% of our electricity comes from wind and solar power. It is absolutely irrelevant. And anyone who thinks, that, as the president does, unfortunately, that somehow we are going to power an $18 trillion industrial economy with windmills, it ain't going to happen. You know, there's an old saying that you can build, uh, you know, you can build windmills with steel, but you can't build steel with windmills, right? And this is, this is the kind of central problem we have right now. Anyways, this is a good news story. As we continue to produce more energy, the price will fall. I have to get this off my chest. There's this, um, there's this kind of idiotic reasoning on Wall Street, and a lot of, you hear this on a lot of the news shows, even some of my friends at Fox News say it, that somehow this falling gas prices is a bad thing. That's ludicrous. When you see this, these prices of gasoline falling like this, uh, this is something that puts more hands, money into the hands of American consumers. What, the other effect that this is going to have, it means the cost of producing goods and services in the United States is going to fall. And that means one of the things as I look forward, I'm very bullish on the U.S. economy right now. I'm an optimist. I think we've got an incredible future ahead of us right now. We're the only country in the world today that's growing. And one of the reasons for that is this energy revolution. But what's cool about this is these prices continue to fall on the price of energy because energy is the master resource, right? Everything that is produced in the economy 
has a central component to it being energy. As those prices fall, I predict we're going to see a massive manufacturing renaissance in America. It's already starting, you know, in states like Ohio, in states like Pennsylvania, in my home state of Illinois, in states like Indiana, states like West Virginia. You're going to see manufacturing come back in a big way. The transportation industry, the airline industry, restaurant industry, retail industry, these are all greatly benefited by the fact that energy prices are falling. I call this the real economic stimulus. You know, President Obama thought all that spending was going to be a stimulus. It wasn't. But this is a true stimulus to the economy. You have to keep it going. Now, point number two. Why has this been such a dreadful recovery? Why is it that Americans are so depressed about the situation in America. And you could see that in the polls when people went to the polls in November. They just felt terrible about the way the economy was going. Now, why is that? And I love this chart because most of you know I am a free market economist. I believe in the Milton Friedman, Arthur Laffer, Ronald Reagan, Jack Kemp idea that if you create a rising tide and you provide the right incentives for growth, that the American economy will boom. Now, the way I like to describe this, and I show this to students all the time, and if you come away with nothing else from this lecture, I hope you'll, you'll uh, take this to heart, which is that in the last 50 years, we've had two presidents that have come into office during periods of great economic crisis. And those two presidents, uh, as you all know, first was Ronald Reagan. How many of you in this room are old enough to remember 14% uh, inflation under Jimmy Carter? Remember that? And 20% mortgage interest rates, and America was deindustrializing. It just, I remember, you know, in the 1970s, I was a teenager. It just felt like, a, you know, what's wrong with our country? It seemed like the American economy was, had just uh, collapsed. Uh, and so Reagan entered office during that time period, and of course, Barack Obama entered office during a period of great economic crisis. No question about that. I mean, the, the banking industry had collapsed, the stock market had gone through this incredible decline. We had seen, you know, insurance companies and so on. The whole financial system was on the verge of collapse. That's what uh, Barack Obama. Uh, inherited. And so I like to say that this set up a natural experiment, a wonderful natural experiment, because both of them came in during periods when the U.S. economy was flat on its back. And what makes this experiment really interesting as an economist is that they use diametrically opposite approaches to rebuilding the economy. So you all know this. We all remember this. What did Ronald Reagan do? Well, he cut tax rates. He deregulated key elements of the economy. He got government spending under control. In short, Ronald Reagan said, government is not the solution. Government is the problem. If we get government out of the way, we can rebuild this economy through the supply side. That is, private producers and private workers are going to rebuild the economy. That was the Reagan approach. Obama comes in with exactly the opposite philosophy. Right? He didn't believe, he believed the government was the solution, not the problem. The first thing President Obama did when he entered office was the $830 billion so-called fiscal stimulus bill of massive spending. And then we had the bailout of auto companies, and then we had Obamacare, and then we had the tax increases on the rich, and then we had the minimum wage increases, and all of these things. The entire kind of left-wing playbook of economic policies were thrown at this recession. Obama tried all of it. Right? I mean, the national debt went up by $5 trillion. We printed money like it was going out of style. The printing press just went up and up and up. We printed $3 trillion to try to generate growth in this economy. Now, that leads us to the question, which of these two approaches worked better? You know, we, we put them side to side. And you can see from this chart that over the last five years from the time of the uh, recession ending, and, and also you know, overlaid with when the recession ended under uh, President uh, Reagan, you can see that the economy grew by about 11% in total under Obama. It grew 21% in that same time period under President Reagan. Now, what, those are numbers that don't may, probably mean very much, but what this is showing you is that the, what I call the growth gap, the Obama growth gap, is now $1.5 trillion. That is to say, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen that the American economy today would be $1.5 trillion larger we would have $1.5 trillion more income and more output if we had had the kind of economy under Barack Obama and the same kind of recovery that we had under Ronald Reagan. That is a gigantic gap, huge. And liberals don't have an explanation for this. I mean, how do they explain? They said they were going to create a worker's paradise, right? That, that this was going to you know, fix the economy forever. Look, the economy is getting a little bit better now, but not because of these policies. And 
the thing that's amazing about that number, 1.5 trillion, and I don't even know if we should use the numbers in trillions anymore because they're so large people can't understand them, but one way of thinking about this is that if we had had this, the kind of recovery under Reagan that, we, that we've had under Barack Obama, the average family today would have $12,000 more income. $12,000 more income. Now, not only does the American uh, family not have $12,000 more income today, the saddest uh, statistic about where our economy is today is that the average middle income family today has lost $1,500 during this recovery. And that's one reason Americans are feeling so dour about things. I actually think Americans are overly pessimistic about things, but there was a poll in the Wall Street Journal about six months ago that only one out of three Americans believed that the American dream still exists, that their children will be better off than they are. That's a very depressing poll result when, when Americans feel like things are getting worse, not better, and this explains a lot of it. Now, I want to show you the next thing, which is I want to show you um, what's going on in the states, because I think this is the other point about the superiority of free market policies over government growth. And it turns out that I've wrote, written this book uh, called um, the Wealth of States with Arthur Laffer, Laffer and a couple of other uh, authors. And it's a 400-page book, and it has incredible statistics about what's happening in the states. But this one chart condenses a 400-page book into one, one chart. And what it's showing you is that, uh, that, you know, let me put it very simply. In America today, one of the most important political phenomenon that is going on is that the red states in America are getting redder and the blue states in America are getting bluer. And so we're getting a divide, an ideological divide in America today between states that are heavily Republican, like southern states like Florida and Georgia and North Carolina and Texas and Tennessee and states like that, versus the old Northeast, especially states like New York and Vermont and Rhode Island and Connecticut and, and uh, New Jersey and so on, that are heavily blue states that are adopting liberal policies. And so as it turns out, um, the four largest states in the United States today uh, are Texas, Florida, California, and New York. These are the states that really matter the most in terms of how the economy performs nationally because one out of three Americans lives in these four states. One out of four lives in these three out of 50 states. And as fate would have it, two of these states are red states, Florida and uh, Texas, and two of these states are deep blue states, California and New York. Now. Here's what's fun about this. So what we did is we just said, OK. And by the way, let's look at some of the policy differentials before I get to the results. Texas and Florida, you all know this because you live here. What is the income tax rate in Texas and Florida? Zero, right? Zero. So that's a huge advantage. There are nine states, including Texas and Florida, that have no income tax. California and New York, not only do they have income taxes, but the highest income tax rate now in California and New York is 13.3%. That's a huge difference. You can buy a house here in California for the cost of just you know, not having to pay taxes in states like, uh, uh, states like California and New York. So, and the other big policy differential, by the way, is Texas and Florida are right to work states. They, they are states that don't require uh, workers to join unions. California and New York are, are, are uh, forced union states. Texas and Florida are drilling states. California and New York are states that don't allow drilling. I could go on and on and on. Texas and Florida have relatively low minimum wages. California and New York have very high minimum wages. Now, here's what's fun about this. You look at these results, and what this is showing you is job growth over the last 15 years, and, and the, the sum result of this is very simple, that for every job that was created in California and New York over the last 15 years, three jobs have been created in Texas and Florida. Now, here's what's kind of fun about this. So do you all know, do you know, all know who Paul Krugman is, the, the econ you know, economist who writes for that in the left-wing rag, uh, the New York Times? He um, had this column, uh, and he and I have debated before. We're going to be debating again this summer, but I debated him uh, about six months ago. And I showed him this chart, and I said, Paul, you know, you have to explain this to me, because I don't have a Nobel Prize in economics. You do. So, you know, and I don't work, teach at Princeton, and you do, but I don't quite get this. You, these states, California and New York, they did everything you told them to do, right? They made the minimum wage, they raised taxes on the rich, they did all, the, all these regulations, so on. And you said that that's, those are going to be the policies that are going to benefit middle class and low income people. And Texas and Florida have done just the opposite. And yet, you know, you've got this result. Paul, you know, please explain this to me. 
Well, he walks up to the podium, and he's a very arrogant guy, and he says, well, Steve, there's a very easy explanation for this. He said, this doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with uh, policies. He said, the reason people are leaving the Northeast for the South is because of the weather because of the weather. Now, as with everything that Paul Krugman says, yeah, clearly, I mean, my God, it's a beautiful day here today uh, in, uh, in um, you know, southern Florida. Who wouldn't want to live here versus living in Cleveland or living in, you know, Peoria, Illinois, or Minneapolis, right? I mean, the weather obviously is a big attraction. But then I just zinged him. You know, you'll love this. So I said, well, Paul, that's a very interesting insight, you know, that people are just leaving because of the weather. So I said, hmm, Paul, could you explain to me why people are leaving San Diego and they're moving to Houston, <laughs> right? Because nobody moves from San Diego to Houston for the weather. And he's like, blah, blah, blah. he had no response to that, right? There is no response because these policies really do matter. Now, by the way, just as a show of hands, how many of you have moved to, New York, to, to Florida from another state? Almost all. How many of you are native-born Floridans? A few of you, but not many. So most of you are transplants to this great state of Florida. How many of you moved here from New York? How many of you moved here? Anybody from Illinois? Uh, I'm from Illinois. Anybody from Connecticut or New Jersey or Minnesota? I mean, you're moving from these blue states to these red states because of, yes, obviously the weather, but the economic climate is much better here as well. I thought I'd just show you this. You know, I, I asked you know, questions about who's from Connecticut. You can see, I don't know if you can see this. This is very small. But these are the states we think have the best forecast for growth over the next 10 years based on their policies. Just so you know, Utah, South Dakota, Indiana, North Dakota, Idaho, we rank as the highest. Florida is, um, where is Florida on there? Oh, you're uh, 16. And look, just look at the states at the bottom, the states with the re worst economic policies in place. I just find this interesting. New Jersey, Minnesota, California, Illinois, Vermont, New York. They just can't get out of this rut they're in because they do just about everything wrong. Now, by the way, this is kind of an interesting one. I'll just show you this. Look at Texas versus the rest of the country. I mean, look at Texas on this, ladies and gentlemen. Is this amazing? So what this is telling you is over the last five years, Texas created more jobs than the rest of the United States combined. You know, I mean, what this is telling us is we want America to look more like Texas and less like New York, right? And President Obama wants America to look less like Texas and more like New York. So that's an amazing thing. I want to show, make a couple more points that I think are really important in this kind of economic lesson, then we'll open up for questions. Uh, I showed this chart to the Senate Republicans uh, a couple of months ago because I thought it was so important that they understood this because the number one issue today that liberals want to talk about is income inequality, right? The gap between the rich and the poor. And what they want to do to lower the income, you know, the, the, uh, inc the income inequality and reduce this gap is they want to raise tax rates on the rich. I don't know how many of you saw this. Uh, this French economist has the name uh, Thomas Piketty has this. But by the way, why, why would anybody take advice from a French economist, right? I mean, why would anybody do that? But, but he has this best-selling book. And he says, we should raise the tax rates to 70 or 80 percent on the rich people to redivide the income and make the pie bigger and help the poor and so on. And I, I want to show you this because I think it's so interesting. So what this, this is showing you, that green line there is the highest income tax rate in the United States over the last 50 or 60 years. And you can see, how many of you remember in the 1970s when we had 70% marginal tax rates and so on? And that was a period when nobody wanted to invest in the United States because when you have a 70% marginal tax rate, what does that mean? I mean, think about what that means conceptually. It means that for every additional dollar that you earn, either as a worker or an investor, and you, let's do the math together. For every additional dollar that you earn as a worker or investor at a 70% tax rate, how much of that dollar does the government take? 70 cents, right? How many, much do you get to keep? 30 cents, right? You follow the, the math here. So you only got to keep 30 cents after tax on the dollar. And what did people do? They stopped investing in the United States. They stopped working so much because who wants to work if you only get to keep 30 cents after tax? And this was the point that Ronald Reagan at Jack Kemp and the Wall Street Journal editorial page and Art Laffer and others made. The tax rates are so high, they're causing a disinvestment in the United States. So along comes uh, President Reagan, and he cuts the top tax rate from 70 to 50 percent. You can see that there. And then a few years later, the top rate came down from 50 to 28 percent. It's a huge deal. That was a massive reduction in tax rates. That meant that at the start of the period, you only got to keep 30 cents on the dollar after tax, right? 
at the end of the period for every dollar you earn, if at the 28% tax rate, you get to keep 72 cents. You follow the math there? So that means that you got to keep twice as much after tax as those tax rates came down. It's not too surprising the American economy went through a boom when those tax rates came down, and of course the American economy did. Now here's what's interesting. If you look at the, the rates, they've gone up a little bit, they've gone up, down a little bit. You see Obama raised them a little bit here. Uh, you know, so we're up to uh, you know, a 40% rate right now. But over the whole period, the, the, the tax rates are now about half of what they were in the 70s. Now this is the fun part. Look at the brown line. Look at that brown line. That is the share of taxes the share of taxes paid by the top 1% in America. You know, the evil 1%, the Warren Buffetts, and the Bill Gates, and the Tiger Woods, and the Hannah Montanas, you know, and the evil people like that. And look at that. I mean, is that amazing? As the tax rates came down, look at what happened to the share of taxes paid by the rich. They went up. They went up. Amazing. The, Paul Krugman has no response to that. What is the lesson here? Well, the person who taught us this lesson was John F. Kennedy. Because people forget, John F. Kennedy cut tax rates. Uh, you know, the, he was in favor of a big uh, tax cut that took effect after he was so tragically assassinated in 1963. But he said this at the New York Economics Club in 1962. And I just have to read this to you because I love this so much. I mean, it's such a profound statement of wisdom. He said, it is a paradoxical truth. The tax rates in America are too low are too high and revenues are too low, and this is the part I love. The soundest way to raise the revenues in the long run is to cut the rates now. Wow. Wow. How many people believe that today? How many, how many Democrats believe that today in Washington? I mean, I'm not presuming everyone in this room is, is, a, is, a, is a Republican, but half the Republicans don't believe this today. And this is such a profoundly important statement. We have to cut tax rates. We have to get tax rates down so America can be competitive. And we, under Obama, you can see we raised the death tax, the dividend tax, the capital gains tax, the income tax rates. All of those were very misguided. Um, you know, I like to show this because this is the new, um, you know, easy tax form that President Obama is going to come out next week. <laughs> Um, how much money did you make? Send it into us. I mean, is there anything that is more simple than that, right? So <laughs> you can expect that in the State of the Union next week. Um, I want to show you another couple of things I think are really kind of interesting. Um, I want to I want to focus now a little bit on the microeconomy, if I may. Um, you know, we talk about prices in the American economy, and we talked about prices in the energy industry and so on. And one of the things that I find is so interesting, I think there's a really profound economic lesson in this chart that. When you look at industries, some industries have, over the last 10 or 15 years have said big increases in prices, and some industries have seen big declines in prices. And so it's always interesting to me to look at where are the prices rising and where are the prices falling. And if you look at this chart, you can see that um, these blue pillars, those are areas where over the last 10 years or so the prices have been falling, um, cars and trucks. They've been falling. In fact, you know, if you bought a, car, a new Ford truck today, it would cost less than the Ford truck did five or six years ago. Um, clothing, textiles, I mean, just go into a Walmart. You know, you can get these, all, you know, T-shirts for 89 cents now, practically. That's falling in price. Um, software, computers, games, toys, you know, phones, anything technological, falling in price. And that's great news for American consumers and American families because it, can mean, it means their real living standard rises because they can buy more with their money. So that's the good news part of the equation, that when you have competition and when you have trade and you have free markets, prices fall and it benefits consumers. Now, look at the areas where prices have been rising. Now, energy is, is up there, but energy in the last few years actually has been declining, so that one isn't a problem anymore. But look, ladies and gentlemen, look at the other two industries where prices are through the roof. Education and healthcare. Education and healthcare. Now, isn't that interesting? What do those two industries have in common? Who provides those two industries? The government, right? These are the two industries in America that are most dominated and regulated and controlled by government. And government controls these and regulates them and owns them because they say they're going to drive down prices, right? That was the whole impetus for Obamacare, right? Obamacare, we're going to have Obamacare, this new health care system, the government's going to regulate it and so on, and we're going to keep prices down. Mr. President, when has that ever worked? When has that ever worked? 
the more government control of an industry, the more the prices go up because they can't, government can't control prices. And by the way, education, I'm just going to say this as a, a point of personal privilege because, you know, I have three children. Um, I have two teenagers who I do not like very much, and then I have an 11-year-old who I'm still very fond of. But, you know, my two teenagers are 19 and 18, and they are both in college now, thank God. And um, my oldest son goes to Northwestern University which is outside of Chicago. Um, I wonder how many, how many of you in this room have a son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter in college right now? Most of you do. Um, I, want, I wonder if anybody could take a wild guess at what I am paying for tuition for Northwestern right now, all in every year, room board and tuition. I heard somebody say 50, I saw, heard somebody say 60. <laughs> 62,500 dollars a year. Six, Ladies and gentlemen, that's thievery. That's stealing. How the greatest, I'm going to make a very pointed point here. The greatest scam in America today is how much these colleges and universities are charging. How many of you are with me with that? I mean, it is the greatest scam in America. This is outrageous. And by the way, just another you know, personal story. When my son was going off to college, you, know, you all know this being um, parents and grandparents. It's a very emotional day when your kid's going off to college. You know, and, my son's upstairs packing his bags and leaving, hopefully forever. <laughs> and uh, you know he's he's packing his bags, and I go up and I say, you know, Justin, um, you know, I promised you, you when you were a kid, I promised you that I would pay for your four years of college, and then you're on your own. And I said, and I'm here to honor that commitment. I'm going to pay your four years of college. If you want to go to Northwestern for four years, um, I'll pay the I'll pay the bill. Um, but I said I want to make a deal to you because I wasn't. I'm a very conservative guy, obviously. Northwestern is a very liberal school, so I wasn't that excited about him going there in the first place. So I said, I'll make a deal with you. You can go to Northwestern for four years, or I am willing and able right now to write you a check for $200,000. You can play computer games for four years, and we will both be better off. <laughs> you say, yeah, that sounds pretty good, right? Uh, but you know, you have to really wonder, is college really worth $150,000 and $200,000? And I would say, probably, hell no. But this is the point. If we had competition, in schools and in healthcare, we could drive these costs down, right? And that's why Obamacare is such a tragedy. Not just because of what's doing to our economy, but because it's, dry, it's gonna drive up costs and it's gonna make healthcare worse in quality, not better. And by the way, just as another aside, how many of you in this room know what a 49er is? And I'm not talking about the San Francisco 49ers. Anybody know what a 49er is today? I think a few of you probably, what? Yes. So a 49er, you're going to hear this term a lot more in the years to come. A 49er is a business, a small business in America that has capped its employment at 49 workers. 49. Now, why do they do that? Why are they doing that? Because the Obamacare law says once you hire that 50th worker, you fall off a cliff. And all of your workers have to be covered by Obamacare and all these extra costs. So what we're seeing across America is what? 49ers, companies, I can't tell you how many businessmen and women I have talked to who've come up to me after a speech saying, Steve, I will be damned if I will ever hire a 50th worker. Now that's a tragedy, right? I mean, here we have you know, 12 million Americans unemployed and we're providing incentives for businesses not to hire workers. That's craziness. That's, that's, you know, that is an unbelievably imbecilic policy. Now, here's another one. How many of you know what a 29er is? Anybody know what a 29er is? A 29er is a business that is hiring workers, but only at 29 hours a week. Now, why would a business do that? Because the Obamacare law says once you pay that, once that worker has 30 hours a week, he's considered, he or she is considered a full-time employee. By the way, since when is 30 hours a week a full-time job, right? But that's what the law says. And so we're seeing what's happening in America is we're becoming part-time America. People can find jobs, but they can't find full-time jobs. And part of the reason for that is because of this stupid law. We've got to repeal Obamacare, and we've got to start over with something that makes much more sense. Um, I'll show you one or two more quick things, and then I'll open this up to some questions. Um, I want to I want to um, end on a kind of optimistic note. So this is the last thing I'll show you. Then I want to open it up to whatever questions you might have. So given all these stupid things that government is doing and the massive deficits, and Mike mentioned the the massive amount of debt we have, 
what is the case for optimism? Why am I such a happy warrior? Why do I think we're, we're, we're entering into this kind of golden age for America? And I would say that despite all these things that the government are doing, the reason to feel so good about the future of our kids and grandkids is that we are living in this digital age that is changing our lives so rapidly and so dramatically that it's almost impossible for people to appreciate. And I. You know, I've been racking my brains for a long time trying to think, how can I communicate this message of how rapidly change has come over the last 10 and 20, 25 years in America um, versus, you know, times in the past? And, and so we put this chart together, and I think you'll kind of find it interesting. What this is measuring, and I don't know how, you, you know, I don't know how well you can read this, but this is measuring some of the major technological inventions and breakthroughs over the last 100 to 150 years. And what we did was looked at how long does it take from the time something really big is invented to the time the average American with a middle income can afford to buy these things. So if you look at the first one at the bottom of that chart, telephones, what that's telling you is that it took um, 71 years from the time Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone to the time the average American could afford to have a telephone in their house. 71 years, that's three generations. The next one we looked at electricity. I mean, what's more fundamental than having electricity in your home? What we found was from the time that, you know, that the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and the rich, you know, the J.P. Morgans and the richest families had electricity from the time that the average family had electricity, that was 50 years or, or two generations. Radios was 30 years, TVs was 20 years. Now look at, as we move into this new age, this digital age, look at how fast, from the time something is invented, it all, you know, whether it's the internet, whether it's personal computers, whether it's iPhones, all these things, they just become almost instantly available. You know, it's just an amazing thing to see. And, you know, I, it's so funny when I talk to, um, you all can probably appreciate this, but when I talk to young people, when I'm on college campuses, they don't get this. They don't, they, so I always say, you know, um, I, I always like to ask them, how many of you kids in this room have uh, a personal computer? They're like, duh, of course. How many of you have the internet? How many, you know, every hand raised. How many of you have, you know, a, a cell phone? How many of you have iPods? I mean, half the kids listen to the iPods while I'm giving my lectures. They all have these things. And they look at me like, of course we have these things. Our kids, and my, my teenagers are just like this. They think living with iPhones and iPods and cell phones and the internet and all this stuff and Google, they think that's like living in the Fred Flintstones era, right? They do. I mean, they can't imagine living without it. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Now, what movie is that? Wall Street. You know, this movie, one, one of my favorite movies, that was, that's Michael Douglas playing the part of Gordon Gecko. That movie was made in 1987. 1987. Look at that thing. Look at that thing. That's a brick with an antenna coming out of it, right? And here's the amazing thing. You want to you appreciate how much things have changed over, because 1987, that's what, a little over 25 years ago. In 25 years, that phone, which got lousy reception, it wasn't a smartphone, you know, didn't have a GPS system, and it didn't talk back at you, that phone cost $4,600. Now they damn near give them away for free, right? And, you know, I, it's just amazing. I've got one of the, I just, uh, for Christmas, I got one of these new, you know, smartphones, and these smartphones are just unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is one you can talk to and you just ask the question and it provides answers. The first question I asked my cell phone was, will you marry me? You know, will you marry? It's so smart to say, I think we should date for a while first. You know, I mean, these are really smart phones. And that, the point I'm making is, these technologies, these are changing our life. And it's not just these electronic gadgets that we have. I mean, that, the stuff that's going on in healthcare right now, I mean, in the next, it's very, very plausible, if not, uh, you know, uh, not just possible, but probably likely that in the next 10 or 15 and 20 years, we're going to see cures for cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis and all these terrible diseases. We're going to see amazing advances in energy production. All of this stuff is a technological revolution that is driving our economy. So where does that leave us? So what's the last point that I would like to leave with you tonight? The only thing that can hold this revolution back is government. Right? We just have to make government smaller, and we have to get it out of the way. Um, I was, when my last, uh, in my last six months at the Wall Street Journal, I promised the last story and then I'll open up. 
we were met by the, you know, it was fun being at the journal because we'd always meet with these muckety mucks from these, you know, um, all over the world would come in. And, you know, we met with the economic minister of China, you know, and he was like the number four in command in Beijing. And I mean, he was a big wig and he came in with this whole delegation of people and he's sitting there, you know, and we're sitting at our editorial table at the Wall Street Journal up in Manhattan. And he's talking about how great the Chinese economy is. And my God, you know, our, we've been growing at 11% on a compounded rate for the last 25 years and going on and on. And you know, look, there's no question about this. What's happened in China in the last 25 years is one of the great miracles of human history. I mean, this is a country, you know, Mao Zedong starved to death 100 million of his own people. People. And now it's a country that is becoming, you know, middle class and it's growing rapidly and so on as they move from communism to capitalism. Great, great story. Uh, and then he ended his, um, his little presentation by saying, and what we believe in China is by the year 2016, he said, we will reach, we will eclipse the United States. We will become the number one economy in the world. And he said, once we, once we you know, catch you people, we're just going to leave you in a cloud of dust, you know. And I sprang out of my chair. You're not supposed to do this, but you know, you cut me, I bleed red, white, and blue, so I couldn't take this much longer. And I said, you know, sir, with all due respect, um, yes, you know, what's happened in China is a great, great miracle, and I want to salute you for, you know, moving so many of your people out of abject poverty and moving them in the middle class. Great story, I said. But not in my lifetime, sir, will China overtake the United States. And I said, the reason I can tell you that with all assurance is that our Chinese are so much smarter than your Chinese. <laughs> he, he didn't like that very much, but, it, but it's true. And this is one of the great you know, advantages that we have in America, that we have the best and the brightest people from all over the world coming here. And you combine that with great American ingenuity, and nobody can touch us. And that's one of the reasons I believe that if, and I'm going to say something slightly partisan right now, but, um, but I think it's important. The most important priority for the country going forward is that we must, 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 must stop her from becoming president in 2016. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So um, I'm happy to uh, take some questions, Mike, if we've got some time. I, I, I know that we've got a hard out at 9 o'clock, but I, I'd love to take whatever questions you all have. And while you gather your thoughts for the first question, I'm going to ask one. Uh, and I know a lot of you are wondering oh. this as well. Why don't you give us your perspective on the 2016 race? You've already expressed one preference, but uh, how's it going to unfold? That's, that's a tough one. Um, so 2016, a couple, a couple of observations, and I'd like to get kind of some of your feedback on this. Um, first of all, let me just say on the Democratic side. I've been saying for, you know, for four years that it is a fait accompli that, that, uh, that Hillary will be the Democratic nominee. But... You know, in the last three months, I'm just not so sure about that. I, I'm just not convinced. I think you see this in the polls. I'll give you an example. In the exit polls, Mike, that were taken after the November elections, 52% of voters said they did not want Hillary to run for president. That's amazing, right? I mean, this is Wonder Woman, right? I mean, you know, the first lady in the White House and so on. Uh, and so there's something, you know, I've known Bill Clinton for a long time. He's, in my opinion, the, and I've met great politicians, Ronald Reagan, you know, uh, Barack Obama, you know, the Bushes. Bill Clinton was the greatest politician in my lifetime. I mean, there's just something about that guy. Um, but Hillary does not have that, I don't like the word charisma, she just is cold. Barack Obama, I mean, Bill Clinton is warm and friendly and, and you know, and uh, Hillary is a cold person. And she's never really had to speak and explain Benghazi. And I think people are kind of sick of the Clintons. And, and I think on the Republican side of the aisle, I think, and this is a partisan thing to say, but I think the Republicans are talent rich on the Republican side right now. And I would make the case to you, everyone who is going to be a likely candidate in this field in 2016 is better than any of the people we had running in 2012. I mean, 2012 was just the low point for the Republicans. And you've got some real deep talent. You've got Jeb Bush. I, I know, you know, people have different opinions. You're all Floridians. Floridians. I think most of you know that Jeb Bush was one of the great governors of this state, great, great governors of any state over the last 25 years, an incredible governor in terms of tax reform and education reform and regulatory reform. I mean, this is a guy who's got it together. Um, so I love Jeb. I love Marco Rubio, your, uh, your uh, governor. Well, as I go through this, I mean, raise your hand if, you, if you're someone who, who would like to see 
Jeb Bush win, win the nomination for the Republicans? A, a lot of you do. Maybe how, how many? How many of you are Marco Rubio fans in this room? A lot of you. Uh, what about? I'm just going to. Who? Romney. How many would like to see Romney run again? A few of you. How many? Um, I'm just throwing out some names. Scott Walker of Wisconsin. Love Scott Walker. A great governor. Courageous. Um, Rand Paul. Any, any libertarians? Just a few, I'm surprised. I love Rand Paul. I'm a libertarian myself. Um, let me throw out some others. Um, Chris Christie. Christie, a few. You know, I got, I, can I just tell you one fun story about Chris Christie? I know Chris a little bit. Back in 2012, um, there was that period when we were trying to find, I was part of this kind of movement, and anybody but Romney, you know, movement, because I just, I just knew that Romney was not going to beat Barack Obama. And, and so I, I remember we had a big group of, you know, a lot of wealthy people, big donors, and we went to Chris Christie and we said, Chris, you've got to run for president. He said, you know, Romney's going to lose to Obama, and, and, and you can beat him. And these people around said, you know, we can raise $100 million for you, and you can be an instant, you know, uh, factor in this race, and da-da-da. And, uh, and uh, I'll never forget, Chris said, uh, you know, I just can't do it right now. It's not my time. It's not my time. And I remember called him the next day, and I said, Chris, you're just making a big mistake. You know, this, this country needs you right now. And... You can win this race, and, and, and uh, you know, you can beat Barack Obama. And he said, Steve, you know, I'm sorry. It's just not my time right now. And I said, Chris, how can you say it's not your time? A, a survey just came out last week. I said, Chris, 40% of Americans are obese. You've got 40% of the electorate <laughs> wrapped up. He didn't like that too much, but uh, no, but, you know, I think Chris Christie will be a big factor. Um, so, look, it's, a, it's just very simple. We, the Republicans have to win in 2016 because if they don't, all of the policies that Obama has put in place, which I think have been disastrous, they will be cemented in place. Yeah, next question. What was so different in the 1930s before World War II that permitted federal spending to help our economy start getting out of the, that depression? You mean why did spending go up so much? No, why did government spending help our economy start getting out of the depression? So this is what, you know, I'm glad you asked that, this question because one of the things I try to do in my job is, is kind of correct factual errors that are in history books. Um, and I would make the case to you, in fact, I think we're write write, writing a book about this, that I would say the biggest myth of the U.S. economy of the last hundred years, and my, look, I, my own son, the other day, came, he's, a, you know, the, the young one, the one I still like, he came home from, uh, from seventh grade, and he was writing this essay, and it started out, the first line of the, uh, the uh, article was, you know, Franklin Roosevelt created the no, New Deal, and this got us out of the Great Depression. I'm like, David, 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 that, that is so wrong. That is so wrong. This is a mythology that Franklin Roosevelt and all this government stopped the Depression. And the statistics are so overwhelmingly obvious that that didn't happen. Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in 1932. He became president in 1933. Eight years after Franklin Roosevelt was president, Eight years later, the unemployment rate in the United States was still 14 percent. Was still 14 percent. Virtually everything that, and by the way, I'm not. It wasn't just Franklin Roosevelt. Herbert Hoover. Everything that he did in response to the depression was the wrong thing. So what did we do in response to the Great Depression? We raised government spending. We raised taxes. We raised tariffs. We increased regulation, and those things caused a total collapse of the American economy. The Great Depression would have been over in two years if we had done exactly the opposite. If we had cut government spending and cut taxes, instead the rates went uh, way up. There's simply no evidence that I can see that the New Deal got us out of the Great Depression. As all of you know, some of you lived through this era, that the, what got us out of the Great Depression was World War II, right? It was putting, you know, four million people in the uniform. And this is, this is one of the things we have to, this is so important because Barack Obama believed that. He said, if we spend $800 billion, remember this? If we spend $800 billion, we're going to end this depression uh, that we're in right now. And he said, the reason for that is we're going to spend all this money Right? And when we spend, the government spends all this money, it's going to cause a multiplier effect. And the money is going to lead to more money for businesses, and people are going to have more money in their hands, and da-da-da-da. And that's going to cause this magical increase, just like you know, Franklin Roosevelt did. And you know what? my favorite economist, I mentioned this before, was Milton Friedman. 
I think Milton Friedman was the greatest economist of the last 100 years. And Milton Friedman is famous for a lot of things. But all economics, ladies and gentlemen, comes down to this one central insight. Remember this one? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. What does that mean? What did he mean by that? He meant that if the government spends a dollar, the dollar has to come from somewhere, right? The government can't create wealth. It can only take wealth. It can only spend a dollar if it takes the dollar from you or you or you or you, right? I don't think there are any little kids in this room, so I think I can say this to an adult audience. There's no tooth fairy out there, right? There's no tooth fairy you know, uh, um, you know, passing out free dollars. So all of this is, is that the government spends a dollar and it takes a dollar from someone else. It's like, let me just, you know, somebody just gave me this bill literally the other day. I don't, I don't really, somebody gave me a hundred dollar bill, okay? So I'm gonna give this to you, sir. I'm gonna want that money back after this demonstration is over, okay. So, um, Barack Obama thinks we just stimulated the economy, right? Because you have $100, right? You can go out tonight to McDonald's, you can go out into the bar and buy drinks, you know, you can do you know, whatever you want, them, want with that $100, and you go to the bar, and then the bartender has more money, it circulates through the economy, and that $100 is going to be a $300 stimulus to the economy, we're going to grow, right? That's Keynesian economics. What's wrong? What's wrong with that analysis? It's, sorry, sir, what's your name? <laughs> so John, John is $100 richer. What are they leaving out of the equation? I'm $100 poor, right? Have we added anything to the economy here? In fact, I would say at best that's a zero-sum game, right? You have plus 100, I have negative 100. But I would make the case it's not even a zero-sum game. This is a negative-sum game because I worked to get the money and John stole it from me, right? And that's not the way you build an economy. Um, Oh, I will. <laughs> okay, Stephen, over here. Yes, sir. Stephen. So I would tend to agree with you on uh, Ronald Reagan's administration. I think it did make changes. Uh, I would probably also agree with you on the, I'm very positive on the U.S. economy for the next 10 years. Um, now, I'm positive on the U.S. economy. But when we look at um, one thing I would mention on the difference between Reagan and Obama's time economically, um, having lived through both of them, I don't think that the unemployment rate during Reagan's administration was as bad as it was during Obama. Plus, I don't think he had two major wars that he had to pay for during that time period. So I, I don't know that I would consider that to be a fair comparison. But i would interested in your view on the fact that an economy has to grow with a population, generally speaking, through the ages of 25 to 40, which are the major spenders um, and consumers uh, for an economy. So I'd like, I haven't heard you talk much about immigration and the immigration bill in Congress, so I'd like you to hear a little bit about that. So on the 25, just so I understand, the 25 and 40-year-olds, you're saying there's fewer of them? Well, I'm saying is demographically in this country, we, we're not as bad as Italy or Japan or whatever from a decreasing uh, population, but, but the fact that our population is not growing, a lot of economists think, will lead to slower growth, not faster gotcha. growth. OK, it's, I get it. Um, first of all, on your first point, sir, you're absolutely right. Every period of history is different. And there were certainly things that were different in the 1970s that what Reagan inherited versus what Obama inherited. My only point is, having, personally, having lived through those two periods, I would make the case where the, what Reagan inherited was much worse than what Obama inherited, because the currency was in total collapse. Remember, we had you know a massive, uh, and in fact, let me just show you something. I, I, this is kind of interesting, a history lesson that a lot of people don't, um, don't know about. But if you look at the, um, this is the stock market over the last uh, 50 years. The blue line is the S&P 500, um, just in nominal terms. The green line is S&P 500 adjusted for inflation. So I've taken into account the, the real rate of return on investments. Look at, look at that period from 1968 to 1982. Stocks um, from, from the tip of the market in 1968 to the bottom of the market in 1982, lost, that's a 14-year period. Stocks lost 62% of their value. Can we all agree that's a pretty ferocious bear market? That, this was the worst period for the US economy since the Great Depression. Now it's true, Obama inherited this big dip there. You can see the second, this dip right here. But that was only a one-year reduction. 
Reagan inherited well, under what I call the four stooges of the American presidency, right? Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Jerry Ford, and Jimmy Carter. Just didn't get any worse than that, right? Uh, that's what, uh, what Reagan you know, inherited. And by the way, you want to see a beautiful story. You want to see the great, great story of American Renaissance. And you know this, you know, you've all lived through this. Look at what happened from 1982 to 2000. That, what you're looking at in that picture, that huge upward ascent, that is the greatest period of wealth creation in the history of civilization. No country has ever lived through anything like what happened in the United States in the 80s and 90s. And I'm not making a partisan point of view. It started here under Ronald Reagan. It accelerated even more under a Democratic president, uh, Bill Clinton. That's what we have to aspire to. We got to get back on that path. Because if you look over the last 12 years, you see why this is the lost decade. We suffered through two massive uh, liquidations of wealth. In, 19, in 1999, remember the, the stock market collapsed when the high tech bubble burst. And then you can see the other collapse, which is the real estate collapse. And the markets hardly regained, um, you know, in real terms, anything over the last 10 years. Now, to your second point, which is a really good one. I'm glad you brought this up about demographics. Um, it is true that if you look at the demographic situation in the United States, we are right now a birth rate which is right at replacement level fertility. We're right at about 2.1, I believe. I haven't looked recently, but that's where we've been roughly for the last 20 years. So, you know, um, we, we're having, you know, two, women are having 2.1 children for every, you know, uh, woman of ch childbearing age. Um, that's not enough. I think we need to increase, you know, birth rates in the United States because we are facing a demographic crisis. Because, the, you know, here we've been talking for the last hour about the economy. I'm so glad you brought this up. The most important factor that's going to influence our economy is the de demographics. There are 10,000 baby boomers that are retiring every single day in America, and they're going to retire, you know, for the next 15 years. And that's going to cause a huge problem because we're going to have more and more people retired and fewer and fewer people entering the workforce. Now, here's my kind of theory about this. That, and by the way, I'm so glad you mentioned Europe and some of these Asian countries because their problem is even worse than ours is. I mean, Japan is a huge problem, and there are just no young people in Japan anymore. Um, these European countries, Spain, Italy, Germany, their birth rates are like 1.7. Uh, France, I think, is down to 1.5 children per married couple. That means like if you project that out for like 200 years, there's like seven Frenchmen left on the globe. You know, that may, may or may not be a good thing, but I mean, the point is their demographic price is a lot worse than ours is. Now, what is, the, what is our demographic safety valve? It's immigration. It's immigration. This is one of the reasons we have such a huge advantage over the rest of the world. We can, and by the way, we can be selective. You know, we can take the best and the brightest people from the rest of the world. They want to come here in the United States. I'll just tell you one story, and then I'll take one or two more questions, and we'll finish this off. Um, I was six months ago. I went out to uh, Google. I don't know if any of you have been out to, in California, Google, but it's an amazing you know, place. It's like a college campus. There are you know, just thousands and thousands of workers. It's like the 21st century company. And they asked me to speak to their scientists and engineers, and I ran through a lot of the stuff I have with you. And the thing that was so amazing about it, I mean, here is this incredibly innovative company that's creating all these new technologies of the future. And I look out at this room, and it was like the United Nations. It was unbelievable. It was like a Japanese we're next, sitting next to a Filipino, next to a Mexican, next to an Australian. And only in America does that happen. You know, only in America. And let me just say one other thing. And by the way, I'm not for amnesty. I am not for amnesty. I don't think anybody in this room is. I think people should come here, but if they come here, they should come here legally. But it is just interesting to me, if you look at what's happening in Europe right now, with what's happened in the last few days in, in France and so on, these countries don't, they're having a, such a tough time assimilating immigrants. They just can't do it. And one of the things that I just think makes America a special place you know, as Ronald Reagan used to say, that this is a, you know, this kind of beacon of freedom from the rest of the world, is we understand, we better understand it, because we have a lot of immigrants, how to assimilate them into the American dream. And, and I do think this gives us a big advantage. Um, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I agree with everything you've said tonight. I'm having, a little <laughs> I'm having a little trouble connecting one, one dot, though. You seemed very confident uh, in your belief that the drop in energy costs are going to be a, a net net benefit to our country. I saw something yesterday that either I got the numbers wrong or it's concerning, but Q1 S&P earnings 
were slated to go up 12.8%. Now, after adjusting for downturns in energy companies in the S&P, Q1 S&P earnings are only going to go up 4.8%. If it's so good for all those non-energy S&P companies, why is there an 8% drop in Q1 S&P earnings? Project at Q1, yeah. yeah, maybe I have my numbers wrong. Mike, maybe he can correct me, but. I, I don't have a good explanation. You know, it's a conundrum to me. I don't get it, right? And I mean, you raise a really good question. Why, are, why is the stock market falling as the gas prices are falling? And I would only, I would only suggest to you where there's some counterfactuals here. So let's look at history. Let's look at, for example, I talked about the, this massive boom in the, in the stock market that happened in the 80s. What was happening in the oil price in the 1980s? Did the oil price go up or down? No, the oil price f fell dramatically in the 80s. And when, when Reagan came, became president, oil was $30 a barrel. By the end of the 80s, it was like $12 a barrel. So as gas prices and energy prices fell, the value of all other assets rose. The same thing in the 1990s. I mean, the 1990s, what happened to gasoline and oil prices in the 90s? They fell. And when the, when the gas and oil price fell, the stock market rose. So my only point is, I don't, I don't understand why people are you know, pricing their earnings there, the way they are. But I would say this. Think about this. What if the price of energy went to zero? What if gasoline were free? Would that be good or bad for the economy? Well, obviously, it's good because that, you know, any time, what you want in a productive economy is prices to fall. You want to shift out the supply curve, and that's what you're doing when the, when the, when the price of th something falls. It's like, would it be a bad thing if cars grew on trees? No, obviously. If we didn't have to buy it, we couldn't use our money to buy other things. So, and the other point about this I think is important to understand is because we're so far technologically ahead of the rest of the world in these drilling techniques, whether it comes to um, fracking and horizontal drilling and these micro drilling techniques, our energy costs are falling much more rapidly than the prices are falling in other places in the world. And that gives our, our manufacturers and our technology industries a big kind of um, competitive advantage over, over other, other countries. So why would five million or so conservatives stay away from the polls and stay away from the polls, in essence, and know that they're going to have Barack Obama as president for the next four years when they could have voted for Romney and he would be president today. And looking forward to 2016, what's the implication? I, that is something that keeps me up at night, that question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, but you're right, you know, evangelicals didn't you know, vote at the same pace that they had under McCain. And uh, there was just a drop off of Republican voters in 2012, and I don't get it. I don't understand why that happened, but it's interesting. If you look at 2016, um, Republicans need to do some certain things if they're going to win. And by the way, let me just make this very clear. I know that a lot of you in this room are not Republicans, and, and some of you are either Democrats or Libertarians or Independents. I am not here as some kind of rah-rah Republican. I am not here to tell you Republicans are the solution to all our problems, because I think both parties are pretty corrupt, <laughs> quite frankly. I mean, I always say you know, that uh, I know the reason that Republicans are the pro-life party is because Republicans always find themselves in the fetal position. Right? <laughs> I mean, they're just cowardly people. So I'm not here as a kind of rah-rah Republican. I just think that given given where the Democratic Party has gone. For those of you who are Democrats in this room, and a lot of you are Democrats, this is not your parents' Democratic Party today. This is a party, in my opinion, that has been taken over by a radical left. And it's a dangerous movement. You see it's anti-police, it's anti-freedom, it's anti-family, it's anti-growth. They've been taken over by the extreme radical Greens. They don't want industrialization. They don't want drilling. Um, I, I, they, they make me very nervous. They're anti-military, and the point is Republicans need to figure out a way to win. Well, if they're going to win, they have to do certain things. The formula for Republicans to win is they have to win 40% of the Hispanic vote. 40%. If they don't win 40% of Hispanic vote, they're probably not going to win the presidential election. So that means Republicans have got to find a way to reach out to minority voters. I'll tell you this, it's real, I find it kind of fascinating as a student of politics. There's one, if you looked at all the polling that was done after the 2012 election, the exit, role, exit polling, you, a lot of you know this, there was one question 
that, that completely explained why Barack Obama won the election. Because if you looked at any economic model, I mean, his presidency, his first four years were a complete catastrophe, right? I mean, Obamacare, the economy hadn't healed, da 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 da. How does he get reelected with that terrible record? And the, it comes down to this. The American people were asked after they voted, which of these two candidates, Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, cares more about people like you? And Barack Obama won that 63 to 32. People thought, even though they didn't think that Obama's policies were a success, they believed that he cared more about them. And this is something Republicans have to do. They have to convince American people they care about them. And they're not the party of the rich. They're the party of the working class. They're the part, you know, that's the kind of key challenge for Republicans. Um, and they did a lot better job of that, by the way, in the 2014 elections. And I, one of the points I've been making is, look, you've got these radical greens that are running the Democratic Party saying, no pipelines, no drilling, no oil, no gas, no nuclear power, no energy. They don't want anything that works, right? And Republicans should be going to union halls, blue collar union halls, teamsters, pipe fitters, electricians, you know, construction workers and saying, we're the ones who are trying to save your jobs. The Democrats are the ones who are trying to destroy your jobs. And those are the old Reagan Democrats, I think, sir, that Republicans uh, can win back. And it happens to be true. I mean, how can, how can unionized households work, vote for a party that's controlled by Tom Steyer, who gives, you know, the billionaire, who is pr promoting all these radical green policies? So I do think there's an opportunity to do it. But boy, Republicans just have an incredible talent for screwing this stuff up. <laughs> they just do. All right, one last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Uh, hello. Over here. Thanks for this excellent talk. All right, All right. two more, and two, then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> well, I have two questions. One, when you showed the uh, income related, uh, as the tax rate went down, the proportion of the taxes paid by the wealthiest went up. Sorry, so can you just move a little closer? I can't quite hear you. Oh, sure. Um, what you showed when the tax rate went down, the proportion paid by the wealthy went up. I just, just. You're talking about this? Right. The question I had, I've seen. This chart? Yeah. yeah. The question I have is, is if it's related, but the charts I've seen shows the wage rate has been relatively flat adjusted for inflation, whereas corporate profits have gone up. So how does it relate to that? Because second question is, in terms of the bank bailout, would you have been in favor of that in foresight and or hindsight, the bank bailout? Would you be in favor of that hindsight and foresight? Yeah, boy, that, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you kind of one, this stays in the room, right? Because this is an insider story that is, but you know, the 10 years that I worked at the Wall Street Journal, you know, it's a very free market oriented, um, uh, you know, editorial page, as most of you know. I mean, what is the theme, the overriding theme of the Wall Street Journal? Free minds, free markets, free people. And this is kind of interesting. The only time I was there in 10 years where we had a na knockdown, drag out fight among the 10 people on the editorial board was the, exactly the question you just asked me, sir, about the, the bank bailouts and whether we should have passed the TARP you know, bill to, you know, and, and by the way, the, the Wall Street Journal official editorial position at that time in October of 2008 was to pass the bank bailout bill to save the financial system. Personally, I think it was a mistake. I think once you start bailing out companies, and look, I know we can have, there's a very strong case for why the economy might have collapsed, but I am a big believer that, re, that the government should never, 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 never bail out failed companies. Because when you bail out failed companies, you reward the wrongdoers. And I believe what should have happened is allow an orderly bankruptcy of the companies that were failing and the banks that were failing, let the strong survive and the weak die. That's capitalism. And I believe in that. And I think we'd be in better shape today if we had not bailed out the companies that made these wrong decisions. And if one of the consequences of that, just to think about it, because I know we all have very different opinions out this. Because of what we did in 2008, we have indoctrinated into our kind of economic system a too big to fail um, doctrine. And I think too big to fail is a huge problem because what we're going to see in America, we're starting to see it right now. What's happening with the banking industry today? The big banks are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The small banks are being swallowed up. You know, the, the whales are swallowing up the minnows. And so you're getting a huge, what you're going to end up with if we don't do something about reversing Dodd-Frank is you're going to have in 10 years time just five megabanks.
that are multi multi billion dollar banks and almost no community banks left everything is going to be just a you know a, a division of these these huge banks and then what happens is they become so huge they become like you know government sponsored enterprises and I just think that's the wrong uh, way to go um, on your point about wages uh, let me just say this I, I wasn't exactly sure I understood your question but but I'm glad you brought up wages because the fundamental issue for American workers today is the one I talked about before that for the middle class workers they have not a, seen a pay raise in 10 years wages have been flat for 10 years they were not by the way there's the myth that wages were flat in the 1980s and 90s that's wrong the 80s and 90s were a period when middle class incomes, when correctly measured, the middle class saw about a 30% gain in their real living standards in the 80s and 90s, but something happened in the early 2000s and it's been completely flat, and in fact, in the last few years, it's been slightly down. That is the fundamental issue that Republicans or Democrats have to resolve, and they have to convince the American people that their policies are going to lead to bigger paychecks for the average American families. And if they don't, they're going to lose. Last question, then, then we're done. Uh, I loved your charts and bar graphs. Uh, one of them showed that education and uh, health care were by far the most enormous risers. Uh, and you blame government on that. How precisely does the government, uh, how precisely is the government at blame for the rise in the education sector? And then the second part is, in the medical uh, sector, obviously Medicare, people live longer and better. How about the, not just government, health insurance companies, which I think add very little but other than increased cost. So the education one is very simple. It's a great question. So how, how are governmental policies driving up um, costs? Well, first of all, at the elementary secondary level, all we do is continue to feed the beast. We just keep spent, you know, the local and state and federal governments keep spending more and more money thinking that as we increase the number of the amount of money we're spending per pupil, that somehow that's going to raise test scores. And what, how's that worked out? If I, I should show, I wish I had this chart. Over the last 40 years, education per pupil has gone up. And what's gone to test scores? They've drifted downward. There is simply no evidence that more money for the schools without some kind of choice and accountability and transparency is going to improve test scores. It just doesn't. And we have such solid evidence of that. I don't mind, you know, when it comes to schools and teachers, I like what Jeb Bush did. He said, let's reward excellence and get rid of failure. And that's what we have to do. I mean, tenure? What in the world is, and I know some of you may be, you know, how many of you in this room were teachers? When a lot of you were teachers. And I, I feel so strongly about this. Good teachers in this country are not paid enough. You know, they are some of the most, right? Good teachers in America are not paid enough. But you know what? Bad teachers should be out. How many of you, I mean, get bad, rid of bad teachers and reward good teachers? That's the way the economy should work. And we're not doing that because of these tenure rules and so on. I mean, in Wisconsin, you want to know something absurd? Because they have this tenure system and last hired, last fired uh, system, in Wisconsin, they had to fire the teacher of the year. They fired the teacher of the year because she was one of the lowest people on the, on the totem pole. And what private company would do that? I mean, really, that, that's craziness. Now, when universities, this is so interesting, the reason university tuitions keep going up and up and up, what's driving that? It's government, because what are we doing? We're providing more Pell Grants, we're providing more aid, more scholarships, more, more, more all of these kind of um, deluge of dollars into the universities. So what happens is, and the evidence is crystal clear on this, every time we make Pell Grants more generous to students, what do you think the universities do? They just jack up their tuition. So what we're getting is a dog chasing its tail. And, you know, let me just give you one example. And the last thing universities want is for state governments and the federal government and local governments to start looking under the hood and see how they're spending that money. They just don't want it. And, uh, you know, the average, I'll give you one amazing statistic. The average tenured professor in America today teaches three hours a week. And they make $150,000 a year. Now, you know, there is something that's going to burst this bubble big time. Big time in the next two, five, ten years. What's that? The internet. 
right? The internet is going to completely collapse the, because you can get the same education virtually online for one one hundredth of the cost. And more and more kids are going to get this stuff online versus going, you know, and paying, you know, for a four-year party, which is what a lot of college uh, is right now. I'm going, to, I'm going to end this by just telling one last story, and then I will let you go. And by the way, thank you very much for your, you know, patience and, and, and you know, thoughtful questions. I want to hammer this point at home again about Republicans and Democrats, because too many times we think that you know, Republicans are going to be the answer or Democrats are the answer. And, and this is just a story. If you want to understand political science, it comes down to this story. It's the story of these two young boys, uh, their brothers, and um, one six years old and one seven years old. And they're going to go down for breakfast one morning. And the seven-year-old says to the six-year-old, you know, when we go downstairs this morning, let's each say a curse word to mom. Well, they start giggling, and they say, OK, that's a great idea. So the seven-year-old says, well, I'm going to say the word hell to mom, and you say the word ass to mom. And they giggle, OK, I'll see. So they go downstairs. They sit at the kitchen table. And you can see the mother's in this room. <laughs> yes, at this. And the, seven, the mother says to the seven-year-old unsuspectingly, well, son, what would you like for breakfast this morning? And he quite cleverly says, you know what the hell, mom? I think I'll have Cocoa Krispies. Well, this mother is so enraged by this. She is so angry. She reaches across that kitchen table. She grabs that little boy by his scrawny little neck, and she's shaking him. And she says, you never use that kind of language in this house again. You go upstairs, and you don't get one bite of food until you realize what you've done wrong. Well, he's terrified, and he's moaning. And he goes up to his room. And meanwhile, the six-year-old has been watching this Mount St. Helens eruption from his mother. And now he's terrified, too. And she sticks her finger right in that little boy's face and said, you little boy, you son, what do you want for breakfast this morning? Well, he's trembling, and he doesn't know what to say, and he's kind of mumbling. He says, well, I'm not sure, sure, Mom, but you can bet your sweet ass it ain't Cocoa Krispies. <laughs> you know? and, and that's our two political parties, right? One screws up, and the other one learns all the wrong lessons from the other one, and it goes back and forth. But America will prevail. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Mike, thanks for bringing me. God bless America. Thank you.